This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Without any further uh, delays, uh, I'd like uh, to, to call on Dr. Roberts, our Chief of Service, to come and present to you our outcome data from UCSF and other news that pertain to our service. John? Well, thank you, Flavio. Um, once again, Flavio has arranged not only a wonderful meeting, but great weather to go along with it and a nice drive up, and so we're all happy to, to be here. So Fla I'd like to also thank Peggy Millar, who's <coughs> really the one who has organized this thing for, I don't know, is this the 20th year? How many years we've been doing this? 20 years now, and, and um, Peggy's been has done everything, and she's kind enough to work with the with our sponsors uh, to get educational grants to support the meeting. And those are Novartis, Estellas, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Lexion, Amgen, Sanofi, and uh, Questor have been uh, kind enough to support the meeting for <coughs> this year. It takes a village to make a transplant service run, and we've got a lot of uh, people that, uh, from both surgery, nephrology, and pediatric nephrology that help us doing it. Dr. Stock, uh, just as you can see the stars by that's name, he's just he's rolling in as the ASTS president, which will make him even scarcer than usual to find. You know, between mountain climbing and climbing the ASTS mountains, he's. He's uh, going to be out there. So um, in terms of the uh, pre-transplant uh, nurse coordinators, you can, we've, they're broken out in sort of areas. They sort of support different areas, deceased donor, living donor, outreach and evaluation. And so when you have an issue, you'll um, frequently have the nurses call you guys up and to, to ask you about one of the patients, particularly when we have an organ, we'll, we always try to get hold of the nephrologist to make sure that the patient's otherwise doing well. The post-transplant clinic is, uh, takes a lot of effort. Um, we have uh, nurse practitioners, um, <clears throat> both in uh, pediatric, uh, the post-transplant kidney inpatient and uh, in uh, the pancreas transplant, Nancy Fonham, has supported the inpatient service for a very long uh, time, and it's always great to have a whole group of people that are uh, taking care of the post-transplant patients. We have a lot of people that help uh, support the, the patients in terms of uh, getting things done. Amy Peel, uh, Helen Christensen, and Melissa are all here today, and you can uh, meet them. We have our social workers and uh, financial counselors that are important to um, <clears throat> our uh, progress with the transplant program. Well, unfortunately, Dr. Tomlanovich is going to be resigning, <coughs> retiring in uh, June of two 2015. He managed to managed to get him to stay one more year. I know he said he was going to leave this year, last year, and this year, next year, we'll be saying he'll leave one more year, but I, I don't think so. And uh, <coughs> Amy Peel is, uh, who's been the, the manager. Uh, is going to be retiring in a month, as she keeps telling us. She's retiring in a month, and we're looking hard to find uh, people to fill both of those shoes. And I think we've interviewed 10 people to fill, to <coughs> looking to fill Steve's job, and I think we're on our fifth looking for Amy's job. So we're really casting a broad net, and I know we're going to come up with, with uh, good people, but not as good as they've been. So just in terms of the um, what we've been doing, the, the, you know, as our as you know, our wait list is uh, still large, over 5,000 uh, people on it. We have, <coughs> you know, uh, actually a substantial portion of the entire wait list in the United States. 
for the people on the wait list, our um, expected mortality is really no different than our observed mortality, and that has to do with you know all you folks who take care of these uh, patients while they're on dialysis for that you know seven years while it takes them to get up to the t work their way up to the top of the waiting list. <clears throat> in terms of the numbers, you can see <clears throat> we've had some increase in a number of our <clears throat> living donor transplants. Our uh, deceased donor transplants have slowly drifted down, and that's you know obviously dependent on the on the regional organ supply. Um, so we've managed to stay with a total number of transplants that are about the same, but it's really been because we've been having an increase in the living donor as as we've sort of seen this fall off and the uh, number of uh, deceased donor organs available. We list about a thousand patients uh, every year, um, and that's a lot of a lot of people. Um, but if you go back to this slide and see that we <laughs> transplant about 350, you can see they're really only transplanting about 35 percent of those thousand people. So, a one in three chance of you getting a transplant. Um, and if you don't have a living donor, you got about one in five chance of. Uh, receiving a deceased donor transplant, the rest of those uh, patients either die, become too sick to transplant, or in remain inactive on the wait list for issues like obesity. If you're a diabetic, you have a one in 10 chance of getting a deceased donor transplant, so pretty miserable statistics. And I met with, you know, I did six evaluations on <clears throat> Wednesday morning of patients, and this is the story I gave every single one of them that this is kind of, you know, you're diabetic, you got a one in 10 chance if you don't have a living donor, and, and it's, a, you know, one in five if uh, you aren't diabetic. So it's pretty miserable stuff to be telling our patients, but we're just telling them, you know, if you can find a living donor transplant, that's really your best option and, uh, while on the waiting list because you're unlikely to get uh, transplanted if you just wait a long period of time. Transplant still uh, with great survival um, in terms of, you know, we have a 98% basically <clears throat> um, one year survival, patient survival after transplant, and about a 94% uh, graft survival. <clears throat> we're, so we're doing pretty well, and really not much as that has changed uh, over a long period of time. So, you know, transplant has better survival statistics and for patients who are, who are listed um, and, and, uh, but remain on dialysis. So a couple things are gonna change. Um, there's gonna be a new allocation system for kidney transplantation, and this is gonna affect uh, your patients. And what it really is is that instead of time on the waiting list, it's gonna be the amount of time that they've been on dialysis. So a patient who, uh, say, got referred late or made up their mind late that they wanted to get a transplant, it doesn't matter anymore. Well, in, in the end, at the, when this new allocation system starts, it won't matter anymore that they're, what day they came to us and what day we listed them. It really what, is what day they started on dialysis, and that will come from the CMS database. For those patients who um, are not on dialysis, it's when their GFR becomes below 20 that that starts the clock, whether they've uh, gone to get a, um, evaluation for transplant or not. So I'm sorry, for the GFR less than 20, they have, to have, they have to have been registered, and then once their GFR is less than 20, they can start getting waiting time. They can't, you can't backdate their, their waiting time to a GFR less than 20. The other thing that's gonna happen is, is that <coughs> they're gonna, um, you know, different kidney, different donors, deceased donors provide different kidneys. So an older donor who's hypertensive, who died of a stroke, who has a creatinine over 1.5, those kidneys don't last as long as a donor who's 20 year old from a, a car accident or a gunshot wound to the head. If you look at the comparable outcome of those kidneys, that best kidney probably has a 93%, <clears throat> say one year survival, whereas a if you look at that kidney from the older donor, sort of the worst kidneys in terms of, of outcome, they're running about 80% at one year. So there's a, there's, a, there's a spectrum of kidneys available. And one of the things that is gonna happen with this new system is there's gonna be matching of those good kidneys 
with the best recipients. So the recipients who have sort of the highest post-transplant survival are gonna get those best kidneys. And so the, the top 20% of those of the kidneys are gonna to go to top 20% of those patients on the waiting list. So those patients are gonna jump in ahead of, of other patients who are waiting. So the, basically it's pretty much the younger patient, <coughs> the non-diabetic patient are gonna have an advantage to getting transplanted with a better kidney ahead of the, of the uh, remaining 80% of the wait list. So it's really an attempt to match the, the most appropriate kidney to the most appropriate recipient. And so we're, it's gonna change a little bit of how we're getting patients ready for transplant. Though if a patient falls into that upper 20%, instead of, they're not gonna be waiting seven years, they're probably waiting maybe a much shorter period of time. And so we're gonna start working those patients up early. So you may hear, you know, be surprised. Well, here's a, here's a patient that's only been on the list two years, say, and, and we're already starting to work them up and telling them that they're gonna get transplanted relatively soon rather than, and you're gonna have other patients who are seven years on the waiting list and wondering, you know, why is, why is this other fellow jumping in front of me? And that's, this is the change in the system so that it's really a younger patient's gonna sort of be jumping ahead of the older patients. Not completely based on age, but age plays an important part of it. Well, so we also had healthcare reform and, and you know, our. Um, there's lots of different changes in terms of insurance, in terms of co-pays, in terms of patients being able to afford their immunosuppressive medications, and I think that's one of the changes that we're seeing in uh, our clinic. There's sort of patients are we're having to, um, you know, sort of look for different uh, options for patients in order to particularly get their post-transplant uh, medications. Uh, paid for, our social workers, our financial counselors are really helping us get those, get patients before transplant, recognizing what their options are, and then after transplant, making sure that we can try and uh, get them their immunosuppressive medication so that they, they uh, can keep that kidney transplant. So as you saw from the beginning, our deceased donor numbers are going down across California, across the country. Um, it's not clear exactly why that's happening, but you know sometimes it has to do with the economy. Nobody's you know, and and we we don't really have a good answer for what's why that is slowly decreasing. Um, the and still we, as we talked about earlier, you know the survival on the wait list is relatively poor, and living donation is going to be the best uh, option for the patients. One of the problems is that you may have a living donor, but they're the wrong blood type, or that they you have an antibody against their cells, and that would mean that they can't donate directly to you. So what we're doing is, with a lot of other centers in the country, we're exchanging kidneys. So if you have a, a pair that are incompatible, we can usually work out some plan where you know <clears throat> your donor donates to somebody else in the simplest matter. They that donor who could donate to you donates to you and so we have just a, a paired exchange but these are as you read in the paper you can have 60 70 80 people in these getting transplanted in these big chains <clears throat> we've uh, performed 63 paired exchange transplants and that's an option so what we tell patients if you have a living donor don't worry if they're un incompatible we'll figure out a way to get you transplanted so that's what we're really trying hard to do that we're also doing some in in center exchanges where um, we can get sort of the patient, the whole system to work a little bit faster for uh, uh, patients that say may have a compatible donor but don't want to wait and, and go through the whole uh, system of the uh, National Kidney Registry, which takes a while to, to, to get those uh, transplants facilitated. So the um, standard uh, living donors are blood type compatible, cross match compatible, then donor and size age and size matched. So sometimes the, you know, it's easy to understand blood type <coughs> incompatibility and cross match incompatibility, but there are, say, a young <coughs> male uh, who's on dialysis who's got his 60-year-old five-foot-one mother who wants to donate to them, and, and that <coughs> kidney, though, it's, they're better off getting a kidney transplant from that living donor rather than waiting on the waiting list. They may not, <clears throat> that kidney may not last in long, as long in that recipient as it, as it might in, in a um, more age and size match recipient. But, so there may be a, a pair where the, there's a 
strapping young man who's gonna donate to his mother and, and, and we can use a, a, an exchange, a paired exchange in that situation to sort of match the outcomes of the kidneys with the outcomes of the recipients. And it, when you think about not only do that, but then you may have five or six other pairs, we can tell the donors, you know, you may not donate <coughs> to your son, but you'll donate and your son will get a transplant and you may help five other people get a transplant in one of these exchanges. And so that's what these types of exchanges are. They're sort of, a, you can, the simple ones where you go across, you know, mother, <coughs> and husband are incompatible and they and you exchange in this direction or you have these chains where there's a UCSF recipient and <clears throat> getting a, a donor from uh, say an altruistic donor and then that their donor donates to somebody at UCLA and UCLA donates to University of Wisconsin and you know Wisconsin goes back to UCSF and so you can have sort of these chains that are really helping us use uh, uh, more of the living donor uh, possibilities that are available. And so we talked about the small <coughs> um, old donor with the large young recipient, and it just really, I think, is a, is a way to sort of match the outcomes of the recipients to the donors. And it, it disadvantages is that sometimes it takes several offers to find a, uh, get that transplant going, and some of the com people that have a compatible pair just don't want to wait that long. So we're do using the in-center um, one to sort of help us get those uh, pairs turned over more quickly. The other program, this is changing the subject, is that um, <coughs> Andy Poselden and, and uh, his team uh, have uh, been doing uh, total pancreatectomies for people with chronic pancreatitis, followed by uh, auto islet infusion and transplant. So people that have chronic pancreatitis, their pain can be relieved by removing their entire pancreas. The problem is that leaves them diabetic. Um, but you can take that pancreas out uh, and isolate the islet cells and reinfuse them back into the recipient. And that allows the uh, recipient to be pain-free and uh, uh, non-diabetic and so that's a new program that we've started sort of along the lines of our islet cell transplant we've been doing islet cell transplants for a number of years and this is sort of a different way to use the islet isolation techniques that we've uh, <coughs> uh, developed at, uh, at UCSF also I'd like to remind you that for um, physicians and nurses we have a um, symposium that's uh, called uh, this year calling Writing the Waves of Change, and uh, it's really a, a uh, learning uh, opportunity for uh, particularly for nurses and, and uh, physicians to learn about different aspects of transplantation, kidney, heart, liver, lung, uh, the whole works. I like you all. Enjoy the meeting. I know you will, and you'll enjoy the, Flavio's special seafood dinner tonight. <laughs> Thank you.